Welcome. In this video, we are looking at the CCMP version 8 uh, curriculum enterprise focusing on core networking. This is going to be the first of two uh, video series. Again, this is focusing on int core. Chapter 26 Network Device Access Control and Infrastructure Security. The big takeaways from this chapter are going to be access control lists setting up protections for the terminal lines and other password protection areas. We're going to be looking at AAA, we're going to be dealing with uh, firewall options, and we're going to end it with our control plane policies, our COPPs. The nice thing is, this is going to be a little longer lecture than the rest of them. However, we're going to be talking about how to actually do some of the content, not just explain the theory behind them. And we actually do have a good amount of labs in this module. So let's go and let's jump right on in. All right, so the nice thing is ACLs are actually a list of ACEs, or access control entries. Basically, these ACEs are performing either a specific function or a task. They will permit or deny, sometimes remark, and submit a comment, uh, packets based off of some type of classification. This could be based on predefined conditional match statements, or it could be uh, based off of an implicit match statement. It really just depends. The packet classification starts at the very top. It has the lowest sequence number. Then it proceeds to a higher sequence number until a specific match is found. Again, when we do this, the first match is what matches. Everything else that precedes it is ignored. So when we're actually lining up our ACLs or our ACEs in an ACL, we need to make sure that we understand that we need to be more general to more specific. That way we are filtering from a general to a more specific nature. If we did a deny at the very beginning and we did all of our allows towards the end, doesn't matter. Whatever comes first, whatever towards the top of the list, that's what is actually processed. And again, it's important to understand that at the end, there's an implicit deny that is applied always. So if something is not matched in an ACL, the last line is always a deny. So ACLs come in a few different flavors, numbered, named, ports, or VLANs. For our numbered and names, we have two subtypes, standard and extended. A standard ACL basically allows you to filter based off the source. And they use numbers, if we're using a numbered standard ACL, it's going to be between 1 and 99, and between 1300 and 1999. And again, they only filter off of the source. If we need to filter based off the destination or something else, we have to use an extended ACL. And if we're looking at a numbered extended ACL, that's going to be between 100 and 199, or between 2000 and 2699. And again, an extended ACL filter is based off of source, based off of destination, protocols, ports, combination, packet attributes, and other things. Named ACLs can be, again, either standard or extended with the same general guidelines. Except in giving them a number, we're giving them a name instead. With port ACLs, again, they're going to be either standard or extended, named or named extended, and they're going to be MAC address uh, ACLs, and they're going to filter data off of layer 2 switch ports. If we're dealing with VLAN ACLs, these ACLs will be standard, extended, named, or named extended MACs, and they're going to be filtering traffic on VLANs. So kind of depending on what we're trying to accomplish, if we're trying to filter off of ports or VLANs, it's going to be one of these either port or VLAN ACLs. If we're trying to filter off of a normal just ingress or egress type traffic, it's going to be either a numbered or a named ACL. The important thing to do is when we're working with ACLs, we have to use what's called a wildcard mask. And essentially what you do for a wildcard mask is we have matching bits. 
So if you take the subnet, for example, the subnet 255.255.128.0, you write that out in binary, you take the ones, you flip them to zeros, you take the remaining zeros, flip those to ones, that's your wildcard mask. Cisco likes to really uh, hish, uh, hit home the complexity of a wildcard mask, but we're just talking about the inverse of our subnet. So once we create a, an IP uh, version for ACL, how do we apply it? Well, we have to put it to an interface. And we have to also say if it's going in or going out. Or we can be doing an ACL that might be applying to uh, things such as route maps or class maps or NAT or terminal lines. These aren't going to be actual interfaces. These are going to be more of a filtering mechanism. So let's go ahead and let's talk about how we create our ACLs. First of all, we define the ACL by using the access lists command. If we type IP, or, sorry, access lists, give it a number, we can then uh, assign it either the appropriate uh, standard 1 through 99 or extended 1 through 199 and we uh, uh, finish it out with the appropriate ACs. From there we have to take the ACL that was set up and we have to apply it to a interface. So we do that by navigating to the interface and we type IP access TAC group whatever number the ACL is and we have to tell it in or out. Do we want to filter it coming into that interface or leaving that interface? So it is important to note at this point that you only want one IP version ACL on an interface, one going in, one going out. For example, you can have an IPv4 incoming ACL and you can have an IPv6 incoming ACL. That's fine. But you do not want two IPv4 ACLs coming in. You want to filter them with just a single ACL as it either comes in or as it leaves. And again, you can have different uh, IP versions. That's not uh, uh, any issue. You can also, instead of using wildcards, you can use specific names like any or host. Host basically means one, one specific address. Any means it will accept everything. So again, host will match a specific address. Any will match everything. How do we type it out? Here's an example of a numbered ACL. Number one means it's a standard ACL, but we type from a global configuration access tack lists space the ACL number that defines either standard or extended. After that we have to type action. Is it a deny? Is it a permit? Or is it a remark? From there we can type in either the IP address and wildcard mask or we could type hosts and the actual IP address. And then finish it off uh, however we want for the correct ACEs and then we have to make sure we apply it. So here we are applying access list 1 underneath interface gig 01 and we do that by typing IP ta a space access TAC group space 1 space in. That way it will take this access list and it will apply it to that interface and all packets being received on that interface. So now let's look at that if, as if it was an extended ACL. Essentially it's the exact same thing, however, we have to make sure that we are doing the correct ACL numbering. The second you put a number between 1 and 99, it's going to code it as a standard. So we have to make sure we are doing between 100 and 199 or between 2000 and two, uh, 2699. They are very important. I've seen people flunk uh, CCNA and CCMP, uh, well, route, 
uh, because of dumb mistakes like this. So here we have the setup, access list 100. We are providing an action, then a protocol, and then we are doing our source. Uh, here we're using any, but it could also be the source IP, source wildcard. The second any is the des destination IP and the destination wildcard. Because we specified TCP, we can filter off of a port number. So we'll filter off of TCP port 23. We can do other filtering based off of ICMP or based off of UDP or IP and so forth. However, when you list a protocol, it is so common that I see this. When you list IP as the protocol, you cannot give it a port number. These port numbers are tied to TCP or UDP, not to IP. So this will not work at all. Yet I see this happen constantly. And then I see people getting frustrated because this isn't working. And that's because they fat fingered up here. The protocol is IP instead of either TCP or UDP. So again, TCP allows you to use port numbers. UDP allows you to use port numbers. IP does not. And the same type of thing applies when you're setting up a, a standard ACL. You go to the interface IP access group, give it the number, and you either process it coming in or egressing that port. Named ACLs, slightly different structure. We do a IP access TAC lists. Then you have to state either standard or extended space either the number or a name. From there, you're going to be put into a sub uh, section for ACLs, which you can then configure. And again, from there, you do either a sequence number or your action and your source, uh, source wildcard. You do the same type of agreement on the interfaces when you do the IP access group. And instead of giving it the number, you'd be giving it a name. And again, either in or out. And here are they in play. So standard ACL named IP access lists. You'll notice it's no longer access list, but it's now IP access lists. Declare it as a standard, give it a name. Then you'll notice that it drops down to a standard in ACL in being named ACL. Then you put the action, you put the source and source IP and destination IP. Go through and then you can apply it to an interface. If you want to do it as a numbered ACL, say, uh, uh, same thing except you don't worry about the IP at the very beginning. You do IP only for names. For the numbered ACLs, access list, give it an appropriate number then action and then source and des source and source IP and destination IP sorry source IP and source wildcard I'm get jumping ahead of myself uh, the extended is the only one that but does both source and destination uh, standard only does source so if you have to list the destination it has to be an extended and you'll notice a uh, named extended at IP access list. Extended, you give it a name. And then from there, action, protocol, source, source either uh, by any or hosts, or you can do the traditional source IP, source wildcard, destination IP, destination wildcard. If you're doing a number uh, extended ACL, you do uh, access list, give it an appropriate number, 1 through 199. Give it the action, the protocol, and then again, what you're matching source and destination wise. And we have labs covering these as well. And this is all should be a refresher from the CCNA because all of this is covered in that as well. So moving forward, we have our port ACL or PACs. So here we have access lists that are applied to a layer two port again they're called uh, packs they can be standard extended or named IPv4 predominantly and they can be named MAC addresses ACLs for layer 2 
Packs have a few restrictions and they do vary from device to device. The following are some of the more common restrictions. Packs only support filtering incoming traffic on an interface. Right now, no egress, only ingress. Cannot filter based off control packets such as CDP, VDP, VDP, PAG, but you'll notice LAC isn't up there, but PAGP is. UDLD and STP. Also, packs are supported only in hardware, not software currently. And packs do not support ACLs to filter things like IPv6, ARP, and MPLS traffic. So, if you're using ports, packs, sorry, uh, for our layer 2 filtering, there is no IPv6 address filtering at all. It is only IPv4 for layer 3. Even though realistically we're talking filtering on layer 2, which is using MAC addresses, so the MAC address should not be uh, being involved with that IP address, but it is what it is. How do we configure this? Pretty straightforward, pretty much the same way as a named ACL. What you do is, on a switch, configure it like a named ACL. Underneath the interface, turn it to switch port mode. Then configure IP access group, and again, give it the name, and you can only filter in currently. And this is a way for you to filter traffic on our switches, on our layer 2 devices. If you need to filter VLANs, for example, that's going to be a little bit more complicated because we have to deal with VLAN access maps. So it's no longer just as simple as typing in one or two commands. Access lists are applied to VLANs, they're called VACs. These VLAN ACLs can be filtering traffic that are bridged between VLANs or that is routed into or out of a VLAN. So, first step to find the VLAN access map. We have to do that by doing a VLAN space access tack map and you have to give it a name sequence. And again, in the next slide we're going to walk through this step by step. Step two, we will configure a match statement using the uh, command match. There'll be match, IP address, ACL number, or ACL name, MAC address, and ACL name. From there, we can configure action statements, either uh, action forward, action drop, action log. So with traditional ACLs, permit, deny, remark, same, similar functions, but they're just changing the names. These action statements specify the action to be taken when the match occurs. Last step is apply the VLAC by using the VLAN filter access map access lists command. The VLAN list can be a single VLAN or range, kind of depending, and you can do them with separated uh, VLANs if necessary. So how do we actually configure that? Let's look at the steps again. Here, on a switch, we set up a named IP access list. Well, we know those are named. We know that these are not VACs. That's not a VAC. That's not a VAC. Because what we have to do is we have to create an access map. So VLAN access map. Give it a number, or give it a name, and then give it a number. You're going to do your appropriate statements. We're matching IP addresses for the protocol ICMP. What are we doing? If we have it, we're dropping it. Action drop. Same thing we are doing if we are having to match IP address for Telnet. We are doing a drop and we're logging it. If there are other prep protocols, we are allowing it to be forwarded. So the action could be forward. You could do forward and log. You can just do forward, it just kind of depends. So this is a brief overview of how we'd be configuring it. So let's talk about interactions between our layer 2 and layer 3. So when a pack and VAC uh, and a rack are all configured on the same VLAN, the ACLs are applied in a specific order depending on whether the incoming traffic is needing to be bridged or routed. Are we talking layer 2 or layer 3? So bridge traffic process order within the same VLAN. 
So we're going to look at the inbound port ACL on the switch port first. Then we'll look at the inbound VLAN ACL on the VLAN first. No, oh, second, sorry. First is going to be the pack. Then we'll look at the outbound VLAN ACL on the same VLAN. Those are only for bridged ports. If it's a routed port, if switch port has been turned off, it will look at inbound PAC on the switch first, then it will look at inbound VAC on the same VLAN first, then it will look at inbound ACLs on the SVI, and then it will look at outbound ACLs on the SVI. There, it could also be different uh, SVIs, different VLANs at this point. And then lastly, it will look at the outbound VLAN ACL on the VLAN. Doesn't have to be the same VLAN, but that way it can look at the different VLANs. So there is a specific order of operations for our different types of special ACLs. So moving forward, using just traditional ACLs, how can we ensure that we have our devices protected? And we do that through passwords. But can we also add an additional layer of protection maybe only uh, allowing certain addresses to access it. Sure, through our terminal lines, we have three main types, virtual terminals, VTYs, we have our auxiliary port lines, AUX, and we have a console port, CTY, or console. If you've gone through any of the CCNA material, or even just any of the CCMP material, you're going to know that these are ports that we've configured. We could do a line con zero. We could do a line aux zero. We can do a VTY or a line VTY zero through a uh, space four or zero space four five through twenty zero through twenty at that point. But that way you can filter based off of these different configurable interfaces because again these are the lines that are going to be used to configure that device. So we have to make sure that we use passwords. So using a password configured directly on the device is better than nothing. However, it's probably not the better option. Normally what I suggest is you configure the device to use AAA as the primary. Then you use a local password as a fallback just in case. So again, using that AAA server, uh, we're going to do this later in this chapter. And that's going to be authentication, authorization, and accounting. Uh, that should be, I've already been covered, so that should be pretty familiar. So, next thing is we have to understand password types. All right, so type zero, plain text passwords. Basically, if you do enable password, that's a type zero. A type five, it's improved. Basically, that's going to be like an enable secret. However, that's not the only one. Type 7, these use Cisco proprietary vintage cipher encryption. Essentially, if you do the uh, command service password encryption, that's a type 7 password. If you do a type A password, this is going to be a password based off of the derivation function 2 or PBK DF2. It's a SHA 256 hash secret and is considered at currently uncrackable. You could do a type 9 password. And this uses a script for a hashing algorithm. Just like a type 8, it's also considered currently uncrackable. So we talked about password encryption as a service. Again, if you take regular plain passwords, you need to ensure that they are encrypted. So when you encrypt type a 0 password in the configuration, let's say like a BGP password or over a plain text session such as Telnet, in an effort to prevent unauthorized users from viewing the password, you can use this service password encryption to ensure that it is protected. Unfortunately, the command service password protection encrypts password type 7 encryption, which is not that hard to break. I mean, it's not the easiest, but it's definitely not hard. So we talked about being able to do a local user versus a centrally located user using AAA. Well, a local user, you'd set that up by getting to a global configuration, typing username, space the username, 
space the password. You type the word password, space the type of password you want. If you don't do anything else, then it will be a type zero. If you do a secret instead of the word password, it will be classified as a type five. If you do username and you define an algorithm, then you do password, then you do secret, then you can actually set either type five, eight, or nine encryption uh, level passwords. Again, type eight and nine are the higher level passwords and they are considered unbreakable currently. So again, type five is uh, using more like an MD5, type eight is more of a SHA-256, and type nine is S-Crypt. So, how do we configure the local line to use our passwords? Well, first of all, you can navigate to the line and you can put your, put your password in. And that is one of the easiest ways. You have to do password, give it the password, then you have to tell it when to check for the password. So that's why you do password, pa you give it the password, and then you do login. That way it checks for your password at login. And that applies whether you're doing a console, whether you're doing an aux, or whether you're doing virtual terminals. And then you can verify by exiting out and then trying to get access to it. And you should, here you have a banner, so you should be setting a banner as appropriate. If we're doing a local user and we have, want password for authentication, we could actually define our login as a local. That basically states use a local user. And you'll notice with a, lo a login local, there's only one type of authentication type, and that's the local option. If you try telnetting, that would also work. If you're using it like a type five for establishing telnet, it should be username authentication. It should be a little bit uh, more encrypted. No, no, telnet is straight plain text. If you're doing this, even though it's a type five password, it's pa passing a password. When you're doing this, you should be using something more secure like SSH. Sorry, I got, I got ahead of myself. When I looked at Telnet, I was thinking SSH because I wanted to point out that when you're doing this, you want to make sure that the protocols you're using to connect to your devices are also equally secure. So if we're looking at privilege levels and role-based access controls, RBACs, you can do certain things. You can certain uh, label them. So a privilege zero user can disable, enable, exit, help, and log out. Privilege one, that's the user exec mode. You uh, can do things like configure terminal. That's only if you have the appropriate permissions. You have to have a privilege exec, not a user exec. So the big thing is, look at this carrot. If it is a carrot, you cannot use configure terminal. You're in the wrong user mode. This is user exec mode. If you are at a pound sign, you are in privilege exec mode. That is when you can use configure terminal. You can also modify privileges by doing the global configuration command privilege, setting the mode, setting the level, and then modifying the level. Though I have actually not seen this really done. I've seen it where I had certain users that needed to be able to do certain things and we didn't want to give them a privilege exec mode. So we created a new privilege mode so we could do that. But again, pretty rare, but does happen. Here we can modify who can do what. So we've modified this user to have a privilege of level five. They can now do uh, interface commands, shutdown commands, no shutdown commands, and address commands. Problem is they can turn off an interface. So that's an issue. Also, you'll notice algorithm type. We're setting this to a script. 
That means we are using a type 8 password. So even though it's configured and it's a some password, it's using a script a hash. How can we verify privilege levels? When you do a show privilege, you can see your privilege level. The interesting thing here is you can modify commands to be whatever privilege you want. However, that's not always the best case. So we talked about controlling access to like a, a console line. So now let's talk about setting access to a VTY line with an ACL. So when you set up a ACL, you're used to typing access lists. Well, with these lines, they're actually called classes, not lists. So we're going to put ac or access tag class, give it a number or a name, and then you're going to either process it in or out. Sorry, this is uh, not access lists. These are access groups. Instead of groups, they're called classes. Because this is done at the VTY. This is access class instead of access group. configure the appropriate access lists and then we can apply that access list as an access class. Getting ahead of myself today a lot. You can also filter what can come into that interface by typing transport input and you can say telnet, you can say SSH, you can say Telnet and SSH. You can say neither. You can say everything. So all or Telnet SSH are pretty much the same thing right now. Or you can filter based off of just Telnet or just SSH. And again, this is done at the line VTY uh, section or the console VT uh, console section. Transport input, and you can modify it to be as secure as you want. So you can filter based off of a password. You can filter who has access based off an IP address. And you can filter based off of what protocol they're using to connect. So there's a lot of options when you're talking securing these different line modes. So here's an example of how you can filter the different uh, line intakes. If you want to, instead of doing like a range like 0 through 4, you can actually set different uh, lines like 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 and then you can set them the transport modes individually as opposed to a group. So verifying the access to the VTYs using the transport so what you'd be doing is you'd be logging in and you could be doing show lines. From the show line subcommand you can see all of the VTY access and you can also see the auxiliary and the console. And you'll notice this is one of the few places you can see console as CTY instead of uh, CON. So here is another way for verifying. You have again, you have a CTY, you have your auxiliary, and you can see the uses, the use, and that will increase. So if we are doing VTY access, earlier I said you should be using SSH, but which version? There are multiple versions. SSH v1, this is basically an improvement over Telnet, but it's still very flawed. SSH v2 had a completely reworked version of SSH, and it's not really compatible going backwards. SSH v2 is a certified under the uh, NIST federal, the, the FIPS, and it does provide very specific graphic standards for uh, usable where uh, feasible. So that means if you're going to be securing your interfaces, you want to secure it using SSH v2. That means we actually have to tell it to use SSH. You also have to tell it to use appropriate encryption. So how do we do that? How do we set up SSH? On a device, you have to generate a username. You have to generate a password for that user. You should set up a domain, and then you need to generate a key. That will be using the crypto key generate and whatever type of key. Normally, we're using an RSA key, 
if we are doing this on a Cisco device. That will generate a key and it will ask you how many bits. Realistically, 1024, uh, 2048, you want a higher bit count. It does take more time to generate the key, but they are more secure. Once we have done that, you can go ahead and do a navigate to the line that you want to configure, do a login local, and that will allow you to do the appropriate SSH. From there, how do we set up things to like protect the aux port? So, because some devices actually still use the aux port for remote administration through a dial-up modem. So by default, the idle exec uh, session timeout is not really terminated. The exec session means it'll stay there turned on. So you can actually disable it if you want. If you do exec timeout, the default will be 10 minutes. That means after 10 minutes of no activity, the exec timeout will run out and the connection will be terminated. If we do a sequence, like if we want to do 2 minutes 30 seconds, it's going to be separated. So you'll see below 2 minutes 30 seconds because it's done in minutes space seconds. What about absolute timeout? So the command absolute timeout underneath the line configuration uh, mode will terminate an exec session after the specified timeout period has expired. Even if the connection is still being used at the time of termination, it doesn't matter. Absolute timeout basically says log them out, period. You can do a logout warning also. It is recommended to use in combination with an absolute timeout that you are being logged out after X amount of time. So they should go hand in hand. And you configure them the same way you do the exec timeout. It would be absolute tack timeout, give it minutes. Log out tack warning, that's going to be in minutes. Sorry, uh, warning is going to be seconds. The absolute timeout is in minutes. I, I forgot that log out is definitely in seconds. And that's going to be preceding the absolute timeout execution. All right, so. Moving on, we have our AAA. So earlier in this video, we discussed how to deal with local users. Well, the problem is local users aren't always the best. Local users mean you have to have either the same user and password on all these devices or you have to manage that. So being able to centrally manage users is the preferred method. And we do that through typically AAA, authentication, authorization, and accountability, or accounting. So AAA is very common when we talk about network industry for two main reasons. Access control of the network, access control for securing the network. That's, just, that's what it is. So our framework for using AAA, authentication, basically allows the user to verify who they are. Authorization defines the access privileges and restrictions. Accounting provides the ability to, to track and log what's been done. So there are two main types of AAA protocols available. The, there's lots of them, but there's two main ones, RADIUS and TACAX. RADIUS is open source, TACAX is Cisco proprietary. So the use case, how do we use this? We can set TACAX or RADIUS so that network devices have to authenticate against one of those two types of AAA services. Or if we want to secure the network, we could secure devices that require logins using, again, TACAC or RADIUS. So it kind of just depends. Networking device access control and securing network access control both focus on access control and both can use TACAX or RADIUS. So let's go over TACAX. TACAX is one that's always really interesting. So TACAX, uh, and it's been released as an open standard in the uh, early 1990s, the TACAX is mainly used for AAA device access control. It is possible for types of AAA networks to access it. 
TACAX uses TCP pre port 49, and it's focusing on communication between the TACAX client and the TACAX server. You can set other protocols that is not dealing with TACAX communication between client and server, but that's at the, the scope of this video. Here we have a user coming on, and they're using TACAX between the user, the end device, and the, uh, the hardware, and they're using ICE as a way to authenticate the device through the switch. This is one way to actually grant network access to the end device using some type of TACAX server. RADIUS. RADIUS does separate authentication and authorization and accounting into individual functions. This is why TACAX is typically a more common. RADIUS is capable of doing the same thing, but RADIUS doesn't separate all of them the same way. So RADIUS, it, a standard AAA protocol, it's used for access control, but the reason that RADIUS is the AAA transport protocol is because of EEP. TACAX does not support this functionality. So that is one of the, the bigger issues why RADIUS is used for transport protocols. Another major difference between TACAX and RADIUS is that RADIUS needs to return all authorization parameters in a single reply, where TACAX can request authorization parameters separately multiple times throughout a session. Comparison chart. So RADIUS uses a combination of ports. TACAX uses one predominant port. RADIUS uses EEP, where TACAX does not support EEP. And so TACAX will encrypt the entire payload. Authorization and authentication are combined in RADIUS. In TACAX, they are separate. Accounting basically does not support network device CLI uh, command accounting in RADIUS, where with TACAX, it does. The primary use, RADIUS is used for securing access. TACAX is used for network device access. Realistically, you can use separate, but I've seen more deployments that use one or the other, not both. So, how do we configure all of this? So there are two main parts for configuring TACAX. Configuring the device itself, and then configuring the TACAX AAA server, uh, either a dedicated server or on a Cisco ICE device. So we're gonna walk through the steps on how to actually set up accounts using TACAX first. So to create a local user with full privileges, we have to create that user first. We do user, username, privilege, algorithm type, set the secret, set the password. Next, we have to enable AAA function, and we do that by issuing a AAA new model. That basically allows us to have a new model of AAA function. Once we create a new model, we can add a TACAX server using one of the appropriate uh, iOS commands. Normally, if we are dealing with a current version, it would be TACAX, TAC server, the host, followed by the actual host name or IP, and a key string. To add the TACAX server on a version uh, newer, you'd be doing TACAX server, server name, enter a subcommand, and from there, enter the IP address and the key string. So older versions, it's all one string. Newer version, it's three strings. Once you do that, you can set up different groups using the TACAX group command. So you'll do AAA group server TACAX and the group name. Hit enter. You'll set up the server name and that will follow the actual server name. This creates a AAA group that includes TACAX server that are all added to the group with the server name command. So again, the server name space server name command actually names that group. The next step is enabling AAA login authentication by using AAA authentication login. Default. This sets the default. You can also set an additional method by doing method 1 or method 2 and method 3 and so forth. 
Step six, enable AAA authentication for the exec by using the appropriate command, AAA authentication exec. And again, we can either do a default or we can do a custom list name and again, different methods. After authentication, we can set up authorization. We do that by doing a AAA authorization console. We're almost done. There are 11 main steps. Step eight, enable AAA um, command by setting up the authorization by using AAA authorization command. You can set the privilege level, you can set the default options, and you can set multiple methods, like a, a local user or a local account, just in case this method fails. Step nine, enable command authorization in the global configuration by doing a AAA authorization config tech command. Next, we have to enable accounting uh, logging. We do that by AAA accounting exec. You can either do default or custom lists. Lastly, we have to set up the command accounting by using the AAA accounting command. And then you can define the appropriate uh, method that you want. So there are a lot of steps of setting up TACAX, but this is one of the better ways for securing and controlling access to the network device. And I wish I could show you, but right now this is not currently a lab, but we are working to develop this as a option. So how do we do this? Here is the commands actually at the CLI. Set up a new AAA model, set up the TACAC server, set up a secondary server, we set up the groups, from there, we set up our authentication, our authorization, our accounting, and with the appropriate groups. And then from there, we can navigate to the appropriate uh, line we're trying to secure, and we can use the default method lists for AAA. So verifying AAA configuration, you would try SSHing in, and you would see what privileges and what versions you're running. And from there, you can start seeing what commands you are able to do and not able to do. All right, so now that we've talked about securing everything via an ACL or setting up AAA, now we can move on to the appropriate security using zone-based firewalls, ZBFWs. Zone-based firewalls are the latest integration of stateful firewall technologies that are included in iOS. They're pretty flexible, very straightforward, and they provide security by establishing security zones. Most other vendors have already explored zone type or zone tagging. So Cisco is now just moving into this arena. So a zone establishes a security border on the network that defines what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. By default, interfaces in the same security group or same security zone can communicate with one another freely. However, if they are different interfaces in different zones, they are going to be not allowed to communicate without being granted permission. All right, so since you're talking the zones, there's the self zone, which is a system level zone, and it includes the router's IP addresses, by default, traffic to and from this zone is permitted to support management. That's going to be things like SSH, SNMP. Uh, there's also a control plane. That's going to be our routing functions, EIGRP, BGP. So after a policy is applied to the self zone, and another security uh, zone can be there, the inner zone communication must be explicitly defined. So the default zone is a system level zone and any interface that is not a member of another security zone is placed into this zone automatically. Once the device comes on, it will actually look for zones. If none are there, none are present, then it's gonna be flagged as the default zone. Anything that is an assigned interfaces are in the default zone as well. A policy map can be created between the two security zones, the self zone and the default zone. What's funny is, how do we do that? So, 
We configure the security zones by using the command zone security or uh, space zone name. Here we have a device where we're going to be configuring it. We have zone security space, we name it. The zone needs to be created on the outside zone, the, the internet side. The self zone is defined automatically, so we don't have to worry about that. The next step is we have to define the inspection class map. This class map for inspection defines a method for classification of traffic. The class map is configured using the class map type inspect and either a match all or match any type uh, option and then we have to give it a class name. Here we have the example of the access lists and then we have our uh, we have our extended class we have a second extended class we have a third extended class and we have a fourth and a fifth. From there you'll notice that we have our access maps and they're matching based off of access groups that are our different ACLs set above. So we have to set up our ACLs. From our ACLs, we can define our class maps then. And again, we're gonna be matching uh, based off of the ACL that are set. So from there, we can ins uh, look and verify by doing a show class map type, and we can do inspect. And that will set up our different class maps and their groupings. After we've done that, we have to define the inspection policy map that applies to the appropriate firewall policy actions. And we do that with a policy tack map type inspect space the policy name. So after the policy map is defined, there are various class maps that are being defined with the class type inspect class name command. We can do things like drop or pass or log or inspect. If it is dropped, this is the, the default action, silently it will discard packets that match the class map. If we want to allow them to be passed in, this action must, uh, makes the router forward packets from the source zone to the destination zone. And we can do this based off of our forwarded packets, but it's only sent in one direction. A policy must be applied for traffic to be forwarded to the opposite direction. And we do that using different uh, protocols, things like IPsec or ESP or other inherently secure protocols with for more predictable behavior. And again, if we're uh, passing, it's one direction, it's unidirectional. If we need to allow for bidirectional, you have to have two pass uh, zone commands. That way, one coming in, one going out. And again, they're going to be applied separately. Lastly, we have the inspect option. The inspect action offers state-based traffic control and the router will maintain this connection session information and permit return traffic from the appropriate destination zone without having to set those commands. I like how it just, the destination zone without and then it just kind of ends because the next slide really doesn't uh, point that out. So anyways, in this diagram, this will demonstrate the configuration of the inspect policy map. So we've started looking at the different uh, policy maps. Here we are inspecting this map, and we actually have to classify the class type, and what are we doing? Are we inspecting? Here we are passing, and here we are dropping. Again, if you do not actually uh, state them, drop is the default option. How can we verify? We can do a show policy map type inspect and you can see the different policy maps and the map types underneath that subcommand. Step four, we have to apply the policy map to a traffic flow source to a destination by using the appropriate command. The command is command zone tack pair security zone pair name source source zone name destination that be destination then. So here we map zone pair security 
This is going to be the zone pair name. This will be the source. You have to actually write source. Destination zone, that will be self. And we're doing a service policy type for inspecting that policy. Step five, we actually have to take this zone and apply it to the appropriate interface. Zone member, security, and you can define what zone they're in in that area. So here we're defining the zone member as being a outside. And again, we're navigating that interface. A lot of steps, and I really wish we had labs covering some of this, but they're still in development. How do we verify? If we do a show policy map, type inspect, zone pair, we can see the different matching pairs. So how do we uh, verify looking at statistics? We can do a show IP access and we can start seeing the matching content as it comes in. How can we verify? we can actually ping something and we can see the violation. So the reason for the packet failure is that the router needs to allow locally originating packets with a self to outside policy. This is not there by default. So what we can do is set up an access list, set up a class map, set up a, uh, another class map for mapping, and then we have to set up a new zone pair for verifying inside outside access. So moving on, we have our control plane policies. These are going to be our COPPs. Basically, the control plane policy is a QoS policy that's applied to traffic uh, to or from source by the router using the control plane CPU. These policies are used to limit known traffic to a given rate, thus protecting the uh, device's resources. Typically, the COPP implementation is used only as an input policy, and that allows traffic to control the plane to be the policy as a desired rate. The COPP policy is then implemented to limit traffic from that control plane. So the QoS policy commands use conform, exceed, violate. So let's actually look to see how we can apply this. So the first thing we have to do is set up the appropriate ACLs. So here we have one, two, three, four, five ACLs. And you're going to see how they're numbered. ACL.COPP for different protocols. We're going to use these for matching. So what we'll do is we'll define our class maps and our matches. That way we can see what ACLs are actually being captured. And we're going to see what access groups are being applied. Then we have to map the policies, uh, to, uh, how the class operates. Uh, you can do a policy map and then give it the policy maps. So in order to guarantee the COPP does not introduce issues, that we have to either use the violate action or the transit or the transmit action for all the uh, vital classes until a baseline of normal traffic is basically established. So you'll see we are using the violate action, drop, violate action, transmit, and we do this until we have a baseline. Then we can start modifying it to see what we are going to be allowing to do. So how do we apply the policy for ZOPP? We do that by allowing a policy map to be set up. We do that by issuing the service tag policy input or output command, and then we give it a policy name underneath the control, uh, control plane configuration. Here we can see the control plane. And then from there, we do our service policy. We're doing it as input, and we're matching that policy. How do we verify? We can do a show policy map control plane input, and that will show you the policy map input. 
And again, we can start seeing the classes that are being matched and their actual, if it's exceeding or violating the packets that they come in. The last main section of this video is device hardening. And it's about being able to protect the hardware resources. The router, the switch has processing, has memory, has things that need to be protected. So what we can do is we can disable protocols that are not in use and that are not being ran on. If your network doesn't use CDP, turn it off. Maybe you can disable certain TCP and UDP services, uh, things like keep alive in, keep alive out, if you don't use them. Disable uh, redirect services like ICMP, disable them. Disable uh, the appropriate uh, proxy ARPs if you're not using them. We can disable service configuration. We can disable maintenance operations. We can disable packet assemblies. There are tons of things that we can disable that lessen the attack surface someone has to attack those devices. That was a lot of material covered, and I'm hoping that I can develop some labs to really reinforce the topics being discussed in this chapter. In this chapter, we talked about ACLs, we talked about different types of AAA servers, we talked about firewall types, we ended it with talking about our control pane policies, we talked about AL, uh, ACLs, ACEs, we talked about secure protocols, we talked about how to apply common policies. We actually looked at how to configure things using like login local, login AAA. We looked at how to set up things like SSH. We looked at how to limit some of the options using like transport input SSH for security. We looked at how to set up new models. We looked at how to set up authentication. We did a lot of service inspections using zone-based firewalls. And so there's a lot of covered uh, a lot of material covered in this chapter. So first, if you have any questions, say something. I have additional content that I'm going to be developing for this material that breaks it down section by section as opposed to one lump chapter. So questions or anything, definitely reach out. Let me know. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic again i'm here if you need anything thank you